Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matthew Weber. I'm joined by Tyler. I don't know what your last name is, Tyler. Um, oh, it's Kelly. Kelly. I did know that. Um, so this is your first episode. So Tyler, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I'm someone who's been using Linux for um, a few years. It, um, Linux wasn't always my main system. I, I hopped between Linux and Windows for, for a little bit for, for work and um, you know, playing games. But here over the past co- couple of years, I've pretty much just stuck to to using um, Linux unless I had to use Windows for work. And so I'm making videos on Linux and um, just just enjoying it, to be honest, <laughs> compared to Windows. I'm mm-hmm. tired of it. Yeah, I haven't used... I, I had a dual boot of Windows for a little while after I built my new computer. And I use it like twice. <laughs> it's horrible. It, it is. All right, so... What we've decided to do is just keep the podcast layout the same for now, even though we've you know done a whole shuffle. Uh, but we'll probably, or you know, somewhat change it up in the future as we kind of get used to what we want to do and remembering to look at the camera. Like you know, yeah. I'm not actually going to do that because my camera's over here. I have a camera over here. I could probably use it, but that would be stupid. Um, why would I want to do it anyway? So uh, w- this week, what have you been doing on Linux and open source stuff? Oh, quite a bit. I have a few things, but I'll I'll try and keep them quick because the main one that that I've been pretty interested in is I've I have this um, Acer Aspire one. Like it's like a ten inch uh, netbook. It was really popular. Like I think I think it came out like seven years ago or something like that. But it was actually my first laptop that I ever got, um, or it was my first computer that I ever bought with my own money. And um, I've I've been trying to use it, but it's, you know, it's a 32 bit system. So, um, you have to, you know, pick and choose your operating system. So I've been, um, trying different things on it and I found open BSD to be, uh, really good on it. Surprisingly good. Um, cause open BSD is, um, as far as I can tell when it comes to the BSDs, it's, it's not the fastest one. It's not really designed for performance. It's more designed for security, but it's, it's actually brought that little, like it's got an Intel atom in it. So it's, mm. it doesn't have decent processing power whatsoever, but what's the app selection? Like I've never used BSD like at all. Um, It's, it's pretty good. There's there. I mean, being fair, there's, there's, you'll find quite a bit of software that isn't ported over to it. Mainly, OBS like OBS is the big one that's just it's not on there but I mean Spectre WM DWM like uh, tiling window managers cute browsers over there like most of the software that I'm used to using is on there it's just some you might find not like Qtile is is one I really like the Qtile window manager but it it just hasn't been ported over to OpenBSD Hmm. but app selection is pretty decently good and that's not something you could, I mean, like, I have no clue what BSD even really is. Um, like, you can, like, build a package or something like that. Like, you could, like, on Gentoo or something. Um, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, I'm not, like, even though I'm starting to use OpenBSD, it's very much the beginning of my journey. So I'm not sure exactly all that you can do with it. Well, you already wait no way more than I do, so. <laughs> like I know well, it exists. I've never, I've never, I've never really had the interest in trying it. Mostly because the software things care. Because like I use Spotify, and I'm sure you probably can't get Spotify on there, right? Yeah, no, yeah. No. I mean, it wouldn't be a you know a horrible thing, but because I could just use my phone. But there are other things that are like that. Like I use Notion. I'm sure that can't be over there. To do is, I use all these proprietary software nonsense foreshadowing. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would probably prevent me from even using it. But it'd be, f- I, maybe someday I'll try to figure it out and put it on a, like a laptop or something. I don't know. Yeah. It, I mean, it, 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 for me, what I've found with OpenBSD is it's a fantastic operating system. It's just, at least, I'm sure there's people out there that would disagree with this, but at least for me personally, it's not a, um, like workstation ready operating system. It's more, it's, it's definitely, um, 
really fun to tinker around with. It's just there's quite a few things about it that just aren't ready for it to be, you know, prime time when it comes to using it for video creation, stuff like that. So so is it meant for like servers or something? Is that what it's primarily used for? Yeah, it's primarily used for servers. And like the security when it comes to OpenBSD, when you start using it, like you'll find quite a few details, of, uh, like small details about it that are completely like and obviously meant for security. Like when you install OpenBSD, one of the main things that you'll notice is if you try and listen or record any audio from a microphone, it will not work out of the box. You have you have to actually and like your microphones and everything are set up out of the box and should work, but they've set it up so out of the box your computer will not allow anyone or you to record from any microphone unless you specifically set the option to be able to record from audio, which I think is is kind of a, a neat thing. Like if you're going to set up a computer and it's got microphones in it, but you know you're you're not ever going to use them, and you would rather you know know for sure that there's not going to be any case where someone is recording you through it without your knowledge. I think that's, I think that's a pretty cool feature. Like, and it's just a small touch where you notice they take security really seriously. Mm, it reminds me of Tails. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, that's that's cool. Um, so anything else you've been doing on Linux this week, or is that what you've been tinkering with? Um, well, uh, th- there's that, and then I've also I have switched to Elementary OS from Arch. Oh. Yeah, traitor. <laughs> I, I can talk to you anymore. <laughs> I know. I, I was just going to do a video on it. And then I was like, dang, man, I really like it's I really like it. The aesthetic is pretty freaking nice. And hey, I mean, it like it. I could give it a chance as my main operating system and, or distro of choice, you know, whatever. And I loaded it up and surprisingly and now I made a video not too long ago about distro hopping and how bad of an experience I had with that. But I decided to give it a chance and I've really liked it so far. And so I've been using that. And then also I'm messing around with Godot quite a bit. Um, I'm messing around with a 3d project. So might, might be making a video on that before too long, but my skills aren't, aren't great. I have issues with elementary OS. I've talked about it before, but I just don't care for, it feels to me like they're prompting developers to develop just for elementary OS instead of having them develop for Linux in general. So it's really so like there's this great to do application. It's called Planner, and it's developed for elementary OS, and it will work on other thing, other Linux distributions and other you know window managers and desktop environments and stuff. But you can tell it was developed for elementary OS and. It just feels like, you know, there's always been a problem with uh, with Linux, the full fragmentation thing. It just feels like that makes it worse. You know, like, I understand stuff that on, on elementary OS can work elsewhere, but it just feels like it's making it. So I've ha- I have my issues with it. Um, and, and I won't disagree with you there. Like, it, it yeah, even though if, it, it's one of those things, like, I feel like if you, if you're a user like of elementary OS, you'll really enjoy the fact that they have their own sort of like design guide and, and like preferences for how developers go about like, you know, making their apps look and feel, but yeah, it definitely does contribute to fragmentation like across Linux, which I mean, to, to be honest, that is a problem that, it, need, it needs to be addressed, but I don't know how, as a community, like we can go about a, like really att- attacking it. Yeah, I don't think that it, it can be fixed at this point. Um, mostly because I think you have you have people like me and you probably you is that you feel that feel that fragmentation is a problem. But we're a very small minority in the group of Linux users. Everybody else thinks that having choice is a fantastic thing, and. And, and and there are times where I think that having choice is a fantastic thing too. But in fact, probably more, the more majority of the time. But when I try to think big picture about trying to get Linux to be more you know popular, fragmentation always is a you know a, a net negative, right? So all yeah. right. So me, I don't know if you <laughs> any of the listeners know this, but I have a crappy camera, and 
it seems to be getting worse as time goes on. Like this is like a forty dollar camera from Amazon. It doesn't even have a brand name. Like it's one of those ones that says ten eighty p webcam on can on Amazon. And I was like, well, that has to be good. Uh, it has five stars. Of course, it has to be good. It's not good. It's it's <laughs> horrible. And like I said, it keeps getting worse. I feel I I'm getting whiter. And some of that is the lighting. So like I have a like a um a video light here, but there's no like uh diffusion on it or whatever so it's like really bright and if i don't have it set exactly right the camera will actually go really dark really light really dark really like over and over and over again especially in obs like right now we're not really recording the video in obs it's coming through discord so it doesn't seem to be his problem but in obs where there's like actual video settings it, it seems to be doing weird stuff so i actually have to have that light on all the time and when that light's on I look like I just stepped out of like a, a, a dark room that I lived the last 20 years in without ever seeing the sun. It's horrible. My last video, I looked like a ghost. It's horrible. Um, the, the, the lack of a neck beard uh, also contributes to that because I'm even whiter without facial hair. So it was it was not. <laughs> you can really tell it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, then, and they accused me of going DT. Like I, I did not go full DT. I have hair. Like there's hair I, up here. It's not a lot of hair, but there's hair. I saw that comment. It made me laugh so hard. I'm like, oh uh, yeah, I, what are I you talking of, about? He's bald. Like I'm not even close to being bald. Like there, I would not look. I mean, I'm not sure. If I you're bald, like, I'm bald, man. Right? Yeah. Like there's hair up here, man. It's like shit. Oh man. All right. So I've been struggling. That's what I've been doing this entire week is trying to get this camera to look at least half reduced because. Getting another camera is, it's going to happen, but I mean, you got to deal with shipping and stuff. So that's going to take like a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to get this to work. I've not been successful because there's not any really good camera software. So like every ca web camera, or whatever comes with its own software, like, in, but it's all windows based. And I'm not even sure if this camera came with it's on software. I have no clue. I mean, like I said, it didn't have a band, brand name, so I doubt they've spent a lot of money on software development. Uh, but yeah, I you know I thought maybe I could look it up and try to see if I could get whatever software there is to run through like Wine or something. I'm not better able to find any of the software, so I've just been dealing with the settings in OBS, and those are not great. Yeah. They're well, and not. also I have noticed I have an Aki webcam. Like it's it's one of those cheap ones, but it actually does have a brand name but for it i've noticed that i think the settings in obs some of them like they don't actually work like they'll they do they like for for one thing that i've noticed on it is the saturation when i mess with a saturation like even though the bar is this long like the changes only take place like within this like section of it if i go too far it does nothing like so well and I mean, there are two settings that I really need. So OBS has saturation like levels, right? It has a saturation slider or whatever, mm -hmm. and it also does the, them supposedly automatically. So I've, you know, I tried the automatic stuff that didn't work. Uh, that for whatever keeps auto focusing, even even though auto focus is off. Uh, so I turned that off and tried to do the whole thing manually, and. You know, I was trying with the with the sharpness and trying with the saturation and stuff, trying to get right. But there's no like exposure um, slider, like so. Oh. Uh, it's a mess, and honestly, I'm just gonna end up having to deal with it until I end up with the Av Avermedia one, Avermedia one that I was talking to you about. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna end up ordering that. But I mean, it's two hundred bucks. But if it's good and it lasts for a long time, it'll be a good investment. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just been a pain in my ass for the whole week, and the, it, it's just weird because when I first got this and I was like, you know, it's cheap. Like, hey, you know, what? that's not bad. It's better than because I have a like a ten year old Logitech on my other monitor. It's mm -hmm. like it's like it was like the precursor to the nine forty or whatever. It'll only record in seven twenty p thirty, and uh. only in four three. So really, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you try to get it to go sixteen by nine, the frame rate goes down to five frames per second, and it looks like you're in stop motion. Uh, oh, awesome! Yeah. yeah. So, because that's the camera I started out with, but it was you know it was fine. Whatever. It's just cameras on Linux just don't seem to 
<laughs> want to be okay. Um, yeah. But maybe that's just with my crappy cameras. I'm hoping with uh, more recognized brand names that it'll be a little bit better because I know that some of the, at least if it has software, I might be able to get to run through Wine. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Anyways, that's what I've been doing uh, all week on like that. And messing around with Xmonad, uh, I seem to say this every single week because uh, I'm glutton for punishment. I can't... <laughs> I'm not good at Haskell, like, at all, but I keep going back into Xmonad, hoping that, you know, I can switch to it for, you know, at least a little while to make a video about it. I I, I, I keep messing around with the configuration files and keep making mistakes because cameras aren't in the right place. It's not. It's not. I mean, I will give you some, some much-deserved credit. I cannot even mess with Haskell. I start... I start looking around at Haskell and I'm like, this language, what's going on here? I I mean, it's, it's super com like complicated to understand for a new user trying to understand Haskell. Like it's not easy. <laughs> it's really not. Well, it's, I've been trying for months now. Um, I made my first videos about X monad probably in December ish. Back when I was like a truly, truly new YouTuber and uh, mm -hmm. trying to get stuff done. And it w those videos were absolutely hilarious. Utter entertainment if you want to look at them. Because uh, it's just me completely failing for like 30 minutes to try to get Xmonad to actually work. To you know, Like I had it installed and I was trying to change colors and change key bindings and stuff for like a half an hour. And it was just fail after fail. After fail. <laughs> and funnily enough, I've been trying ever since then. I'm still just as bad at it. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the contact information. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so. We're on Twitter. I'm at the Linux. I'm at MTWB. The Linux Cast is at the Linux Cast. Sandy, you're not actually on Twitter, are you? No, I'm you're not. You're one of those people who are anti-Twitter. I have a feeling about you. Um, um, actually, I used to be on Twitter, so I'm not anti-Twitter. It's just I've 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 gotten off of it, and you and Twitter um, have broken up. I get it. Okay. Yeah, you can follow Tyler at the official Zany on live library and odyssey and you can subscribe to him on youtube the link for that will be down in the description below definitely check him out he needs some more subscribers uh you can Thank subscribe you. to all of our stuff uh audio wise and video wise at the linuxcast.org or on on uh youtube at youtube.com slash linuxcast and i'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons which you can find all of our patron stuff at patreon.com slash linuxcast I don't actually have a list of all my patrons here, so I have to go look at it. Uh, let's see if I can remember. Devon, Marcus, Merrick, Donnie, Maglin, Camp. I'm forgetting one. Uh, it, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, 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 you did good, a, though. There's a seventh one. I don't remember your name. I, I think you're the new... Oh, Mitchell. Yes, I remembered. Solid, um, man. Yeah. Good memory. Um, that's only going to happen, you know, once I get past seven, my memory is going to, you know, I mean, I think we better just stay at seven. <laughs> so I can't remember anymore. <laughs> All right. Anyways, so each and every week, we each, each of us will be selecting a news topic to talk about. And I'm going to go first this time. Um, I don't even remember what I chose. Um, Oh, yes. So System76 has unveiled a brand new desktop environment based on GNOME. Um, because there aren't enough desktop environments out there based on GTK. We needed one so more. So true. So true. <laughs> um, I, I think I think that they've done this in response to GNOME 40 because GNOME 40 has significantly changed the, you know, the look and feel of GNOME. So they're probably doing this in order to have more control over the uh, their own user, user interface. So I'm assuming that that's the reason why they're doing this. Um, but if you've taken a look at it, and you can find the link in the description below, mm -hmm. it is, um, well, I mean, it, obviously it's early days, but it doesn't look, I mean, it looks like GNOME. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why they bothered. It doesn't make Same, sense. but at the same time, I will say the one thing that I do give them a uh, little bit of credit for is the separating of like applications and the like Rofi like, you know, like um, launch 
launcher, I guess. I, I, I don't know what they're calling it, but it's it, it's a run launcher. Come on. Yeah, well, I mean, it looks kind of like what they're doing is they're taking their... They're just taking standard GNOME and then automatically, you know, um, enabling tiling by default. And yeah. have you used the material shell thing for Tyler, uh, tiling? Mm-hmm. It's not great. <laughs> I... Uh, I'm, if I'm going to be completely honest, I hate it. I, I don't, the, the thing that gets me about their tiling that like really upsets me is like, if you're going to implement, like the tiling in GNOME makes no sense because the title bars, like they don't get smaller or anything. They're just the same size. And I'm like, I mean, if you're going to be tiling and making it more keyboard driven, yeah. Well, yeah, Why? turning on the tiling should turn the title bars off. That's we can agree on that. That's that's point number one. The second thing is is when you're in a tiling window manager, the number one thing you always do with every key binding is hit the super key, and that mm-hmm. means your super key has to have just one use. It's the modifier for every other key on the key- keyboard. But in GNOME, the, the super key is also the activities button, right? You hit mm-hmm. it and you hit get to your activities view. It has dual use and it doesn't work. So you, the, their tiling thing, I mean, it's a good effort and it's not as if it's you know completely unusable. I mean, it's not. I mean, you can use yeah. it. Um, but if you're going to use a tiling window manager, just use a tiling window manager. Or they need to go through and say, you know, if when you turn the tiling on, we disable the functionality for the super key during this time and we get rid of the title bars. I mean. Yeah. That I understand from a development standpoint, that's hard because, excuse me, the um, the super key is hard coded into GNOME. You're not gonna get that rid of that very easily. Um, yeah. Maybe that's the reason why they've forked GNOME. I mean, because that's basically what they've done here is fork GNOME, and mm-hmm. maybe that's the reason why they've done that so that they can go through and make it easier to actually go through. Because they seem to like the tiling idea, and as I mean, you and I are both tiling window manager, you know, aficionados, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to use a big word um they, they seem to be kind of like that so i mean they you know maybe that's the reason why they've gone through and done this so that they can have more control and focus more on the tiling aspect but i don't i don't feel like the i mean pop os has become very popular over the last few years because it's it's kind of like ubuntu but without all the ubuntu-ness you know, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, that's it a great way of putting it. Right, it doesn't have the focus on snaps. It, it's meant for like gaming, and it's supposed to be really, really fast. And uh, for some reason, people seem to trust System76 a little bit more than they trust Canonical. Right? And they have all these things, but I don't feel that there's... Uh, I don't think going through and making this shift to something totally new and radically different is going to necessarily work out for them. Now, maybe they'll be smart about it because they went through when they switched to Pop OS on their like hardware or whatever. Mm-hmm. They maintained. Uh, I actually, I think you can still go through when you order like one of their computers. You can have regular Ubuntu installed, or you can have Pop OS installed. So maybe this oh. will just become like a third option, at least until it's you know, more mature. So those are my thoughts on it. I, uh, like I don't know because I I've, I've used that tiling thing before, and it's just mm, no bueno. You know, yeah, it's not, not, yeah, it's not great. Um, maybe you know, I was thinking, maybe if you hadn't used an actual tiling window manager before, it'd be okay. Good you know, point. Like, if, Good you, point. if you don't have the experience of what the real stuff is like, you know, then maybe it's just you know, this is oh, this is cool. You know, this is automatically yeah. putting things. Cause, I mean, they've they've always had that like uh, snap mode or whatever where you drag things around and it snaps to mm-hmm. a quadrant or whatever. This is basically what that is only it's i've had people tell me that's essentially the same thing as tiling which that one gets me like no it's not (laughs) no it's not (laughs) but like yeah i think i think you're right i think it's a i think it's a great in between for you know moving from a desktop environment to a tiling window window manager can be a very stark difference so maybe the tiling is just to, you know, get yourself comfortable with the idea of a tiling window manager so that you move into it. But yeah, I don't I don't see this like new desktop environment really doing super like or changing too much about the, you know, view on GNOME and stuff, but maybe maybe it'll work out for them. maybe it'll it'll be really good, but 
to be honest, as long as they don't do the thing that Ubuntu did where they, you know, come out with unity and then force it on, you know, everybody when it's half baked, uh, I, I think they'll be fine, but, uh, there's nothing stopping them from doing it. So, well, yeah, yeah, hopefully they'll just do it. Like I said, they'll do it smart and just make it an, you know, an option. Uh, mm-hmm. if, if they go through and make people, I mean, cause I mean, most people, I don't think want to, I mean, I, if most people wanted tiling window managers, they just use a tiling window manager. Mm-hmm. So, uh, most people probably want to be able to drag this in front. I'm assuming that whatever they end up with will probably have the option to turn that off. Because I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, from that video they had, it looked like there was like that little tiling button up there at the top. So maybe they'll be able to just turn it off, uh, or maybe it won't even be default by the end. It will just look like GNOME. In which case, I'll wonder even more why they bothered. Yeah. Um, so, because like, I mean, at that point, all they did was separate out the applications from from like making it a separate two two windows. Which, I mean, cool, yeah. but that's not really it, like super innovative. Or, yeah, it's, like that's why it's one of the reasons why I admire what like Budgie did, like with the Solus guys. They went through mm-hmm. and they yes, they went through and used I, at first it was GTK. Now they use Qt, I believe, um, but. When they went through and created a new desktop environment, they actually created a new desktop environment. You know, they did the work. Mm-hmm. Where well, they didn't do th- something like, I mean, Mate is just GNOME 2, uh, but modernized. XFC has basically been the same for the last 20 years. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Ubuntu has been using the same look and feel since 2000, like 10 or something when Unity came out, 2009 ish, 2011. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's somewhere around there. It's looked exactly the same uh mm-hmm. and even when they went through and changed to gnome it stayed you know the same uh gnome has when they went to gnome 3 that's looked the same up till gnome 40 and even and i don't know if you've looked at gnome 40 but that looks i mean yes it looks different and, and behaves a little bit different but you can still it feels still feels like gnome right so yeah. when, when we get a new desktop environment it just feels like usually it's just the fork you know it's just yeah. somebody taking gnome and it's almost always oh, gnome i mean do we, there's very there's very few if any like true forks of kde have you noticed that yep mm-hmm. like I, I, and i mean there are implementations of kde plasma that look different like on garuda or something uh but there's still you know plasma or whatever there just doesn't seem yeah. there doesn't seem to be the willingness of distributions to fork kde and make their own as there is with gnome and maybe it's because gtk is easier to code for i don't know yeah maybe it's your maybe it. like i don't know it's a thing all right so what's your link for this this week um for for this week it is the dark mod and it is so this is like a really interesting um game uh i've so i've been i've been checking out um some free and open source you know games and just in in general different different types of games and i found i found this and i have never heard of it um even though it seems to be a a pretty popular um game but as the title might suggest that it's a mod it's not. It started off as a mod for I believe it was it was I believe it was Doom Three, uh, like your or, or it was at least like based off of the Doom Three engine. Um, but they've switched over. It's now standalone, and I just I I had to talk about this because for one, when it comes to free and open source like games. Um, for like you'll have there's like two classes of free and open source games there's the ones that are you know a, like zero ad or um i'm trying to think like open arena or something like that where you can just you know if you have a distribution that has a software center you can just install it and in, you know button press or if you have something like arch you can get it from a pa- your package manager maybe the aur or something like that so it's simple to install and then there there are the other ones like freedom where it's, I mean, it's a game, but you only get the project files. Then you've got to go out and get an engine and do all of this stuff to get your game up and running and working. And this one, I, I found it to be extremely easy to install, 
extremely like it, it's what is it four steps four steps no no excuse me excuse me i missed one there's five steps and they're extremely easy to do and then it's a uh, it's a game that's very heavily um thief inspired um and as somebody who i never really got big into the thief games um so i don't really have a frame of reference when it comes to um how like true to the series it is but it, I have been playing the absolute heck out of this game. It is super fun. Um, just sneaking up behind people and conking them on the back of the head <laughs> and trying to stay in the shadows. Like I, I, I found it to be really fun. Um, ha- have you checked it out at all? I haven't yet. I'm not much of a gamer like at all. Um, mm-hmm. My gaming is pretty much limited to Hearthstone, and even that I don't play as often as I used to. Um, now, I was really into City Skylines for a while, but it crashes like the dickens on linux like you can't run it for more than a few minutes and it just crashes on you mm-hmm. maybe that's just me i don't know uh but i've I never have... i've never gotten into the city skylines i have a buddy who keeps telling me he's like dude you just gotta try and try it you'll get addicted you'll love it let's see i got i got really really into like sim city back you know back in the day like when i was really young and played sim city 2000 and sim city 4 was just like the most amazing thing ever. And then they ruined it with the whole online thing with the SimCity, whatever the most recent one is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then like City Skylines is just kind of like SimCity, but with like, Uber control. I mean, it's really cool. And it's it's great because the whole mod scene is like huge mongus, right? And they have tons of mods. So I think one of the reasons why it crashes for me is because I have all the mods installed. <laughs> like, <laughs> not all of them, but I mean, it's like way too many. So that's probably the reason why it crashes. I mean, but yeah, I'm not... I want a game. Like, I have an Xbox 360 that I've had for ages, but it has not been turned on in four years. Same. I, I have one I haven't turned it on in a year. Like, I doubt... I mean, it's sitting on the floor. It probably has three or four inches of dust on it. It's... I have... I have. I, have, oh, I, have, I don't have, like, a lot of games. I have, like, I don't know, probably six games. And one of them is Batman Arkham City or Arkham Asylum or something. Mm-hmm. Never been opened. <laughs> still has... Really? The, yeah, still has the... Still has the cellophane wrap on the outside. That's how much of a gamer I am. Is that it's still sitting up there. It, I mean, it's like a, a collectible at this moment. It's like it's never been opened. Um, uh-huh. It's probably worth like 25 cents or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I've been told it's a really good game. I wouldn't know. I haven't played it. Now, like I have Skyrim up there too. I played that a little bit. but Because um, I, like, I really like Elder, I liked Elder Scrolls. So um, mm-hmm. I thought I'd get into Skyrim. But I could... By the time, you know, I by the time Skyrim came out, I was just not a gamer anymore. Like we used, to, I mean, I used to do a ton of game. Like we, you know, we didn't really have time for this, but we went through and played that Gran Turismo and a whole bunch of other games. Definitely mm-hmm. to see our podcast from last week with Martin's last episode because we, yeah, we talked about one. retro gaming, so it, it was good. Anyways, um, let's go ahead and um, move into our. We're we're thirty five minutes in. We're we're just now getting to the main topic, but that's just the way it's going to go. So, this was your topic. So, uh, I reworded your topic to um, quote DT. So, is proprietary software garbage? And um, well, I don't remember what's your original topic. Software proprietary software on Linux really a bad thing. So it was much more uh, PC of putting it. So, what are your thoughts on proprietary software? We don't need PC titles here. Um. To be honest, that when when it comes to proprietary software on Linux, it even though people talk about like you know it being okay and it being something that like there's too many people out there that are not willing or not uh, okay with the fact that proprietary software is available on Linux and is it's just a thing like i i think we need proprietary software on linux not because it's good to be proprietary software but it makes the transition for newcomers to linux much much more digestible like i mean we all like i don't, I don't know about you but i remember that my first experience with linux 
was me installing it and then noticing how much wasn't available on Linux. And now that's no longer the case. And I think it's a good thing. I, I think having the option to use Discord, having the option to use Spotify is a good thing. Not necessarily that you should be using them, but... You, you and I option. tried. You and I tried to use an open source solution to record this show. And it was horrible. <laughs> it, it was not a good experience. So if we didn't have Discord, we would be using Skype. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, don't talk to me about open source VoIP projects. They're not good. At least the ones that we've tried so far have not been a, a good experience. So Sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to put that out. Oh, there. no, no, no. That it. You're right. Like, I, I, I don't think we can afford to be like the the whole like free software foundation sort of mindset of where like if if you even allow proprietary software to be installed out of the box on your distribution like that's no bueno we can't have it like i don't think that that helps linux adoption at all i mean it you're you're just making it more easy for a person who doesn't know anything about Linux to say, well, why should I even try it? The stuff that I'm used to isn't even there. So I, I guarantee you, even those people who are out there saying that proprietary software is the root of all evil are still using proprietary software in some form. They have to be because unless they're not using a computer at all, uh, every single thing that makes an Intel processor run is proprietary. You know, that's mm-hmm. in the kernel. You if you there, there are ways of getting around it, but you're not going to have a uh, like there's a Libre kernel out there that will run on some so- some hardware. Uh, but try getting a Wi-Fi card to work with a Libre kernel. You can't yes. do it. Um, I mean, I, I should say that you can do it, but it, it, you... it, it, it's a significant hurdle in order to get it to actually work. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And if you just want Linux to run out of the box, you have to use like, the regular bog standard kernel that has all these proprietary blobs in it. And you're just, you have to use that. I mean, because that, that's what enables the vast majority of hardware to run. Um, and yeah, that stuff's in the background. Like you don't, that's not in your face. You're not getting, it's not like you, in order to use your computer, you have to log into Microsoft Word or something. But I think really the, really weird feedback in my headphones right now um <laughs> i i think that the reason why proprietary software has such a bad name is mostly because of microsoft's propensity in the past to be horrible to linux i mean they sued linux uh, tried to sue linux out of existence and that gave a lot of old timers people who've been in the linux community for a long time a really bad um like a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to proprietary software. And mm-hmm. because Microsoft is a huge, is one of the huge companies that have a lot of software that people want to use, Office and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And Adobe is the same way. Adobe has been very, uh, I want to say, like they've been uninterested, I guess is a nice way of putting it, of bringing any of their software to linux i mean i think the only software that adobe has ever brought to linux was like adobe reader or something i mean i think you could get like mm-hmm. adobe reader back in the i mean seriously does anybody still use adobe reader but um i hope not <laughs> i mean it's just the thing i mean flash obviously would work on uh, uh linux but that wasn't adobe bringing it to linux that was like google and you know firefox or whatever bringing it to linux so uh, i i think that the the position against proprietary software has really been uh it, it it's been pushed back and given a bad name because of the way those companies have treated open source software a lot in the past mm-hmm. but i think that there's this whole idea that all proprietary software is bad but i i really i think that there's the real way to say it is that there are some there is some proprietary software that is bad like uh, not necessarily bad but it's not privacy respecting or whatever, but there's good proprietary software. We're using Discord right now. I don't mm-hmm. think that, I mean, I think the vast majority of people would say Discord's actually a really good thing. And it's actually, I think that they've, can because they've brought their client natively to Linux, I think that's a great thing because Same. without it, 
I mean, it would feel like there was something missing, right? Mm -hmm. If you, especially with gaming, because Discord is a huge thing with the gaming community. We've tried so hard over the last 25, 30, 40 years or whatever it is. I mean, it's a long, long time to try Mm -hmm. to get gaming on Linux. And we're seem to finally be succeeding. We've tried we finally with the help of Steam and Proton and Lutris and gaming on Linux and all this stuff and wine, you know, we're finally making some headway in that area. If we didn't have Discord because we were so against proprietary software, which I mean which would be completely hypocritical because all of gaming is pri- proprietary software for the most part, mm-hmm. uh, it, it'd feel like something was missing, right? It it, it It'd be another reason why you'd want to go through and game on Windows because you could then talk to your friends. I mean, it's it feels like Discord's completely changed the way a lot of people do gaming, right? Um, yeah. I don't know. It it, it 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 boggles the mind a little bit that people are so against. It. I mean, I I like I can understand wanting to use as much FOSS software as FOSS FOSS whatever. Mm-hmm. You're saying FOSS software, FOSS software, software, it's whatever. Um, but but um, I, I understand that, and I, I do too. There's a reason why I've been stuck on Firefox, even though Mozilla continues to piss me off. It's because mm-hmm. I want to use an open source browser, and I don't trust Brave, and I don't get the whole cryptocurrency nonsense. Uh, and like I, I want to use, the browser that I want to use is Vivaldi. Like It's based on Chromium. Oh, okay. You know, and they seem to at least have some cool about innovating and stuff and make it look a little bit different and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's an open source. I've been, I've been dragging my feet on it, right? So that's, I mean, I understand the whole idea of wanting to go through and use, uh, you know, FOSS stuff. But on the same thing is, I, I, if I were only going to use FOSS stuff, my experience using my computer wouldn't be as good because there's certain things that we just don't cover. We don't do a good job with messaging standards like Discord and stuff. I mean, there's Matrix mm-hmm. or whatever out there and, and stuff, but it's um, a messaging platform is only as good as the number of people who use it. So mm-hmm. um, yep. you can have, you can ha- it's the reason why Mastodon is horrible because there's nobody there. Right. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, it's the same thing with any open source federated kind of thing is that there's just a small number of people there and it's not as fun as somewhere as like a Twitter or Discord or whatever. So mm-hmm. uh, there's just those blank spots that Linux doesn't seem to be able to do as well in. Yeah. Um, so. And I mean, I think it's one of those things where like it could get better. It, it, it could like when it comes to FOSS software, but the idea that we we can't we we can't tell people that it's okay, like it's not okay to be like you shouldn't use proprietary software it, it's just not like it's okay to use whatever works for you just you know over time don't ever get get to the point where you're not okay with trying a uh, FOSS software like I, even though Discord works and it works great for for what we need it, if a free if, if a FOSS piece of software comes out and lands in front of us and it you know it, it does everything that Discord does just as well, yeah, I'll I'll use it. But that, that's the thing: there are some proprietary software that just does things either better or just does things that FOSS software can't right now. It just it has FOSS. Some pieces of FOSS software haven't matured as much as the proprietary software has. So, you know, just use what works. Don't don't be so uh, negative Elitist? towards people who use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's the whole. There's the whole. Uh, I mean, we talk a little bit about the elitist stuff in a prior podcast with me, and Martin. But I mean, it's the whole. I think there's a perception out there that if you limit yourself to just FOSS software, you're somehow better than those people who intersperse, you know, proprietary software in their workflow. Mm -hmm. And really, that's just complete and utter nonsense. I mean, Mm -hmm. just because one person just sticks to all FOSS FOSS stuff doesn't make them any different or better than me because I use proprietary software. There's there are items of proprietary software that I, I couldn't live without <laughs> there'd yeah. be no reason for me to use my computer if i can you know have gaming on here or, or have you know my to-do 
program, which is a proprietary piece of software or um, Notion or uh, any number of things on here that I just complete. I mean, I use all the time. I think, I mean, you're probably the same, right? You have proprietary mm-hmm. pieces of yeah. software that just are in your workflow that you just have to use. And yes, I could go to completely fast. I could find a to do uh, app that isn't to do us. That's completely open source. I could do that. Um, I could probably even figure out a way to sync it between that and my phone. I could, you know, it'd be extra work. Uh, there's an open source version of Notion out there that you can host yourself. Uh, I could use that. It's a pain in the ass to set up. I've tried, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but I could use it. Um, there are open source options for Discord and um, all these other things. But it's a, I mean, it, it feels weird to say that those things are too hard to do. Um, because, I mean... You, I'm a self-proclaimed lazy person, but and and so it's kind of true that it is too hard to do. But it's also, mm-hmm. it's more than just the convenience of it. It's more the things that I'm used to. You know, I mean, like I'm not opposed to doing those things. It's just more I want to be able to be comfortable with what the things that I want to use and going through and changing to something new and working to get it set up. Maybe I get some kind of, you know sense of accomplishment for doing that but if it's not as good when i get there you know it, it could be Why? a problem yeah and i mean to, to further that point like a piece of software being proprietary isn't necessarily like in of itself a reason to not use it like if the proprietary soft like discord right here if if it, it becomes a thing where I don't feel like my privacy is, you know, for, for one, when I use Discord, I use Discord with the knowledge that anything I say on here could could be traced back to me. So there's, and also like I have my own server with a picture of me. So, you know, it kind of be pretty arrogant to think that no one would be able to figure out that, you know, this is what I'm saying. Well, and it's so, not but, meant to be, it, it's not meant to be private, right? It's not as if, it, yeah, it's not like Signal, like where you're. It's meant to be, you know, encrypted or whatever. It's it's meant to be something. It's it's it's. I mean, people didn't go through and complain about AOL chat rooms back in the early 2000s or whatever, because you know, you they were sharing all your messages. That was the point, you know. But mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it'd be, that'd be silly. Yeah. And it's, it's just that type of thing. Like, I feel like so many people have the the mindset of, you know, you just can't use anything proprietary. No, like if, if you don't have a reason f- to leave it um, and find an, uh, something else that works better for you, that's FOSS. I mean, uh, there's, you don't, no one should be telling you like you can't use something proprietary just because it's proprietary. It, there have to be other reasons not to use something other than just because of the license it's under. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the way I look at it. Like, I don't want to really use anything that's Google, right? Because I know Google's actively taking, you know, uh, all the data and selling it. Like, that mm-hmm. that's a good reason not to want to use anything by Google. I still use Google stuff because it's really good. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I've tried to switch duck to, to DuckDuckGo. It's atrocious. It's not, it's utter garbage. <laughs> it's so bad. I mean, f- for the vast majority of stuff, I end up having to search on Google or on DuckDuckGo. I just have to research again with the G-Bang, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the way it is with a lot of stuff. I mean, like Google's really good, but I can understand when somebody says, well, I don't use Google for these reasons. But if somebody just said, I don't use Google because it's proprietary, that would make me think well you know that's a dumb reason yeah you know yeah. It's, a, it's it's taking those reasons a little bit farther than like i don't use google because they're data sucking monsters um you know that's a that good reason. is a good reason right? sorry to cut you off yeah same thing with microsoft i mean um, i don't use microsoft because they hated linux back in the 90s i'm not holding a grudge it's a <laughs> it may not be a fantastic reason it may not be a rational reason but it's a good reason it's better than because they have proprietary stuff um, mm-hmm. and it's the same thing with any other thing. I don't use discord because I don't know, because the moderation stuff on there is not very good. That's a good reason, you know? Uh, and it's the same, it's, like I said, it's the same for any piece, piece of software you want to use. I, it, it, like you said, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good reason to not use something just because it's proprietary. 
it, it, it you have to have other reasons. <laughs> have yeah. have other reasons, and and then it's I'm I mean okay, so I never want to be one of those people who say you want know, to. I, I don't want to become those people who, who say, you know, don't use proprietary software or I'm going to judge you, you know, into oblivion. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you want to be that kind of person, I don't want to be like you. You use <laughs> what the hell you want to use, you know? I'm, I'm mm-hmm. If you want to go through and install GNU Geeks or whatever, it, it, one of those Linux distributions that you've used the, the Libre uh, kernel or whatever, you want to be one of those people and you want to go through and jump through all these soups and get your stuff up and running. I'm not going to judge you because I sat through and, and installed all the suckless software. And mm-hmm. there are a lot of people out there who just don't understand why I sit down there and take all the time to get DWM up and running. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was one of those people before I used suckless software. I, uh-huh. I, was, I, like, I couldn't, I could not understand why anybody would go through and, and waste their time on DWM. It was like, the, it looks hard. There's no documentation. The people who development are, are arrogant and mm-hmm. uh, go completely against the idea of having a community. I mean, they don't want to help anybody. And it, it, I mean, I couldn't understand it. Then I was like, you know, I'm going to try this. And I still come back to DWM every single day because it's the my favorite window manager. It's the one that mm-hmm. I want to use. Uh, I like Qtile. I like uh, BSPWM. I, I'm, I started in i3. It's my pride and joy my i3 config because i'm so proud of getting it under 100 lines and everything but i keep them in the dwm use what you like to use uh, and even have the reasons you want to you know whatever reasons you want to have to use it, even if those are dumb reasons yeah if, if your only reason is because it's proprietary um, i'm gonna judge you for that but still just use whatever you want to use yeah yeah um so that's i mean seriously uh, yeah. I, I, like it's just so one of those things that, the it's one of those things in Linux that are always gonna, it's always going to be uh, an issue that is debated upon like um, GNOME versus KDE or uh, what's the best package manager or more recently Snaps versus Flatpaks or something like that it's yeah. always going to be yeah, it's going to be one of those topics that's going to be on podcasts like this one for all of eternity because, for the most part, we're never, ever, ever going to agree on it as a community because it's just, mm-hmm. I mean, there's going to be people out there who absolutely hate proprietary software. There are going to be people out there who say, you want to know what? I use proprietary software because just in some cases, it's just fucking better. Yeah. The way it is. So, I mean, uh-huh. all right. We literally talked that to death. So let's go ahead and move into our apps of the week. So Tyler, why don't you go ahead and give us your app of the week for the first first time? Mine is Flameshot. Um, if you don't know what Flameshot is, it's a GUI like screenshot utility. Um, it's it's really I found it to be really um, useful and. Um, it's got a lot of features built into it that um, make it very, I, I don't know, it, it's, it doesn't feel bloated, but at the same time, it has plenty of features that make it really, really easy to use. Because as, um, like for me, when I'm taking screenshots, um, there's plenty of screenshot utilities out there for just, you know, ca- like easily capturing your entire screen and calling it a day and, you know, editing or doing whatever you want to in GIMP afterwards. But Flameshot makes it really easy to just have, um, you know, a system tray icon running and just whenever you want to take a, a screenshot of a portion of your screen, you click on that and you can select it and it's got easy tools for like if you wanted to draw an arrow to something or you wanted to apply like a Gaussian blur over someone's face or, you know, whatever you want to do with stuff like that. It's got, it's got features. You can add text to a screenshot like in seconds. It's just, I found it to be a extremely useful, like, you know, and very small utility. And it's, it's really amazed me because I've, I didn't, I didn't expect to come out liking it as much as I did. Have you oh, ever cool. used it? Um, maybe. When I first started using Linux full time, I was probably looking for a, so- a screenshot utility, and I probably tried it. Uh, right now, I'm just using the XFCE screenshot thing, um, <laughs> and really because I don't need any of that other stuff, I just need to take a screenshot. Um, 
uh, my thought is if I'm taking a screenshot to like show somebody something, if they can't use their eyeballs to actually find that on the screenshot, then I've lost all hope in them anyway. So yeah, <laughs> uh, um, I, I'm not going to do, I can, you got to remember, uh, I really should change the channel to just lazy man Linux guy. Um, because anytime I can be lazy about something, I will be lazy about it. So that's just the way it is. So, all right. So mine, my lap of the week is called Castero. I made a video about this, but basically what Castero is, is a terminal application to listen to your podcast and and it's amazing it's so good it's it's the the biggest downside to it is it's written python so it's slow and by slow i mean like you notice that it's slow like you can tell that there's like a, a millisecond or five milliseconds or whatever delay between pressing the pause button and actually stopping mm -hmm. that's the only thing i've come across that it's not you know a good thing the rest of it is it's easy to add podcasts to. It's, it remembers your position in podcasts even when the application closes and comes back. Uh, you know, it, it's easy to download stuff for offline use. It's it has good quality. You can speed up the podcast. So if you listen to your podcast, you know, uh, you know, two times the speed or whatever, mm -hmm. you can do that. Or you can slow down, obviously. So it has all the features you'd want, and it's in the terminal. So uh, it's right up my alley because I love everything that's in the terminal. So. Um, that's the one I've been I've been playing around with enough for almost a week, and I'm I'm not one of those people who go through and listen to podcasts on my computer like at all. I listen to them on my phone. That's same way. I mean, you're supposed to do it, I think. Um, but with this, it's actually got me listening to podcasts on my computer more than I ever had before. So um, yeah, really? Castero is the one that I've been I've been uh, trying out. It's really good. Um, now I got a question for you. When you post a video on Castero, because I didn't, I didn't see any comments about this, but I just have to ask: Did you get any comments of people talking about the fact that it's Python and slow? That yes. millisecond of delay. Yeah. The, the very first comment was like that. The second comment was like that. I'm pretty sure the third comment was like that too. And then it branched off into some of my more regular, you know, viewers. Uh, but definitely mm -hmm. the first three comments were all about, well, well, this is what you get when you use Python. Well, you know what? <laughs> Python is like proprietary software. It, it's good for what it does. It always cracks me up when people talk about how s slow Python programs are. Like Ranger. I had someone tell me that, like, you know, I need to stop using Ranger because the, you know, like I'll, I'll notice a night and day difference in speed. Ranger is perfectly fine. It's not slow. Ranger is like, not slow. <laughs> like, like, I, I, I've never noticed it be slow. It's my favorite, too. Um, I, I I have it on my little like I on my um oh gosh uh, my Ryzen laptop it's it's got I mean it's not an underpowered chip by any means but it's not a you know an eight core sixteen thread processor I've got here on my main PC and it runs fun like. Ranger is not slow. Like Python programs when you're running something in the terminal, it, it like unless you can't deal with something having like one or two milliseconds of delay like how are you that anal about speed like, well, how can you even perceive that speed i don't even know so i have yeah. uh, a laptop here this is from 2011 it has a um i don't even know i think the, the sticker might be still on it i don't know this has a well it has an i7 in it but i'm pretty sure it's like an i7 like 1100 or something it's it's a, it's some crazy old processor on it ranger runs mm -hmm. perfectly fine on it like it has no problems on it like at all um yeah. i can run kd plasma on that thing i'm and i'm gonna notice that there's like a a, a a thousand millisecond delay in ranger i mean this does come on people are so stupid uh, yep. i just called commenters on my video stupid i'm just <laughs> i didn't mean it leave a comment it's okay you can you can hate python all you want it doesn't matter yeah I'm it's still gonna okay. judge you for it but um because i i hate haskell i can't stand <laughs> haskell so i would be if somebody said that this thing was was written in haskell i would be the first person on the video commenting why are you using haskell it's so dumb <laughs> all right that was fun all right i think that's it i think i've had enough uh we, we can sit here and rant about pro proprietary software probably until our faces go blue and well I could probably use uh, some blue tint to my facing as I'm still the whitest person in the history of whiteness. But uh, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, we're not going to do that. We, I mean, we've been going for an hour and one minute, so I'm sure I'm going to cut some of that stuff out because you will take out some of the silences, but whatever. Anyways, thank you for watching. Uh, we record this video or the podcast every Thursday now, uh, and it will be released probably on Sunday issues. Sunday issues? Sunday. <laughs> it will probably be released on Sundays to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you'd like to get it early, like two days early, you can subs- you can support us on Patreon level two, three, and four. Get it two days early. Uh, if you want to, like I said, if you want to listen to this early, eventually, if we ever get advertisers or whatever, you'll also get the audio feed completely ad free. So, patreoncom slash linuxcast support us there. Thanks to everybody who does support us. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Like and subscribe. I'll see you next time. See you, Tyler. See ya. Have a good one.